Welcome to Access to Perspectives Conversations, the podcast for bridging academic landscapes. At Access to Perspectives, we provide novel insights into the communication and management of research. Our goal is to equip researchers around the world with the skills and enthusiasm they need to pursue a successful career. You will get insights around the topics of scholarly reading, writing and publishing, career development, project management and research integrity, all embedded into open science practices. Learn more about our work at accesstoperspectives.org. Welcome back, Jigisha Patel. It's a pleasure having you on the in in the on the show again. Um, thanks for joining today. Thanks, Joe. Thanks for inviting me. It's, it's lovely to be back. And because you're the expert of on integrity when it comes to scholarly publishing, we thought it might be useful to have a how do you say uh, to to provide a scope of topics that feed into integrity in a research context that editors um, can and should look out for and where they might be more or less experienced to give some guidance and explain a little from your experience to to share with us, which can at the same time also be useful or certainly is also useful for researchers to um, look back at what research questions they ask and how they then um, package the results to present in a research article to submit to an editorial team to consider. So what is research integrity and what's part of that? That's a very, very broad question. I'm sorry. <laughs> Quite, um, no. <laughs> no, no, I mean, you can get very philosoph philosophical about it, but it, it's, a, it's a way of behaving you know, there are there are various um, definitions of research integrity, but they cover concepts like acting with honesty and respect and precision, um, so that your work can be trusted. Your work can be, you know, accepted as face value, as um, trustworthy and real. So in in order to provide an overview of the scope of integrity topics, um, yeah, what are what are examples of what it may entail in a scholarly publishing context? What's integrity for scholarly publishing? Well, in scholarly publishing, you want to you want to be ensure that what is published is an accurate representation of what research was carried out and um, you want to be confident that that research has been presented in a, in a transparent and honest way. So, I mean, research integrity boils down to underlying principles of behaviour, which are supposed to apply to everyone who's involved in the research process right from the beginning. So from the researchers who first have their idea about how, you know, what's their research question, all the way through to the uh, journals that they submit to and the editors and the peer reviewers who assess their research and everybody should have this sort of underlying principles in mind mm -hmm. and if you look online for you know definitions of research integrity they cover similar things there are lots of definitions but they're things like acting with honesty um, making sure that you know you plan your research properly uh, you, you choose the appropriate methods for your research question um, you, tr you present your results in a transparent way so that other researchers can reproduce it. Um, and that's really important. I mean, being willing to share your data and your methodology and what you did is, mm. is another way of acting with integrity and also being accountable for the work that you do so that if you make a mistake, being willing to put your hand up and say, I made a mistake, this research is no, you know, not right. Or, or you know, if somebody in your team did something unethical you know being willing to put your hand up and say yes okay you know this is wrong we need to we need to correct this mistake having respect for everyone and everything involved in the research so that would include research involving humans and research involving animals um you know to avoid suffering to avoid waste and then making sure you're working at all times you know as rigorously and accurately 
as you possibly can. So your work is very sort of meticulous and not slapdash. Mm. And these are principles that not just apply to researchers, but it, it should apply to everybody involved in the research process. Right. But their roles are slightly, you know, even with if they have slightly different roles in the process. Right. So there's I've come across the term good scientific practice or good research practice. Is this like more or less the same or is it of wider or lesser scope when, uh, compared to research integrity? I would say it's 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 more or less the same thing because I don't I think research integrity is a state of mind and a state of behaving that should permeate through all of your behavior during the research process so it, it, it is part of your research practice that is part of research integrity right. your practice yeah. should be good you, you know you should be applying best practice to your research yeah and now like with access to perspectives we are ground most if not all of our work in open science practices will you, will you say oh that's an a thought that just came up linking the two is it that open science principles give guidance on how to execute and enable research integrity to come to its fulfillment, like to to stay true to integrity in a research context, because open science gives you the tools and the processes and the methodologies and the research approach, as in transparency, how do we how do we achieve that by making our data fair? Um, so one is the call for integrity, while open science has the same values and principles underlying, but now gives guidance on how to execute. Am I making sense? So I, I think so. I think so. I think open science is fundamental to research integrity. So the, the principles of open science and the guidance of what to do. Mm. It's, it's essential for there to be proper scrutiny of the work. Um, proper scrutiny of the work is essential for there to be any kind of sort of process of quality control or maintenance mm. of integrity. So I think if there isn't, you know, the ethos of, of open science, if, if authors are not willing to share what they did clearly or share their data, What's it the makes point? the whole process of scrutinizing the work um, much, much more difficult. Oh. And then if you can't see what was done or you can't retry what was done, that, that what you did as a researcher cannot be validated. So no. I would say it's a foundation. It's a foundation of research integrity mm. and practices. Yeah. And now, given that most of my other researchers are struggling to certain degrees with implementing open science practices, because we're countering the current incentive system and several aspects that are also discussed on this podcast and the wider community. So it's actually not easy to live up to our own integrity standards. Is like some might argue it's almost impossible, but is it also in the sense that we don't, like, done is better than perfect is one thing that comes to mind but you know as an integer and as as open as possible and then where there are constraints we will keep those in mind and, and work towards solving these as well so what i'm trying to say is there are certainly several aspects in a researcher routine where they might find themselves struggling with, again, living up to their standards that they self-impose or that they see imposed by integrity principles, imposed by the institution or the nation national research or funder committee, whatever. Um, but as much as possible is always what we want to achieve, right? Like, in, is research integrity, is, is it also what you would say it's never 100%, but it should certainly be more than 80%, like if we want to put numbers to it. That's right. And I think it's it's certainly very difficult for researchers at the moment, even if they understand the principles, you know, and, and the 
the values behind it, it's very difficult for certainly junior researchers to, to navigate through and try and stick to their values and principles when they're under pressure to behave in a different way. So, you know, uh, you, you know, as a researcher, you might want to share your data, but you can't because your supervisor won't let you or, you know, you want to publish in a particularly uh, a, a journal with good good policies about open science, but you can't because, you know, your co-authors want to go for a different journal. So there's there's always going to be barriers there. But I think, you know, as a movement, as in the individuals, it's, it's a struggle, but there is a movement happening Mm. which I hope will improve things for the future. So as far as possible, as a junior researcher, you know, you can do what you do, but accept that, you know, certain things are out of your control. But mm. as more senior researchers, I think the senior researchers are the ones who have the power and therefore the responsibility to make changes happen. And they, you know, they could sort of require that, you know, their their labs and teams publish, mm. you know, in journals that support open policies or publish or, or, or and also reward um, behaviors that support open policies mm. and the classic argument is moving away from journals with impact factors and sort of researchers have the same rewards but they're rewarded for different behaviors so they're rewarded for supporting open science and the validation of science rather than rewarding publishing in sort of high impact journals mm. That, but this has to come from a high level. It's not something that junior researchers can, I think, yeah. do. And like I try and encourage junior researchers to to raise discussions where they see opportunities, yeah. but they're certainly not on the decision making end. But like as much as possible and on an individual basis, um, kind of to assess like more or less constantly or as often as possible const uh pushing the 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 limits where there are constraints and and if it's for some to change jobs like just finish get done with your phd and then find another institution that's more open uh welcoming or yeah um and then there is my also like what I also think is often missing from the conversation of open science is the limitations of open. There's also a few good reasons for less open when it comes to sensitive data, especially in medicine where you're coming from. So we're not trying to advocate here that anything needs to be fully transparent. It's not the point, but we need accountability. And that again feeds into integrity. Um, because as as a researcher community with all the stakeholders involved, stakeholders involved, including funders, policymakers, publishers, we have uh, accountability to the societies we serve and who we do the research for. Um, and that's asking for accountability. So even if the data is not fully disclosed, we need uh, clear documentation of the methodologies, the like where the archive is, uh, the data is archived. How, how the methodologies and research scopes were chosen. For what reason? What was the motivation to start with? And I sometimes also find myself um, saying that, or questioning: Do we still, at these days and times, this is now a broader question: Do we still have the luxury of doing research for its own sake? Or should we put research to purpose, like which has always been the case, but now increasingly so with um, challenges like climate change, obviously, but also one conflict in too many parts of the world now with the global media coverage. We it might be that we don't have more wars, but we know how they all come to rise, and like there's there's we have an opportunity to. I think for the first time with all the connectivity and interconnectedness also of research communities across the globe to have peace on earth. And that sounds ideological, but I think that's something where research integrity can really come to play through open science and through the willingness to mm. do better to ourselves, but also the planet at large. Oh, okay, that's like a big utopia for you, but I don't think it cannot it cannot be a utopia. It needs to be a realistic aim to achieve. 
Okay. I mean, I think realistically, the research happens where there's the funding. You no. know, that's the bottom line, isn't it? So. Yes, and still, oh. we just experienced with the pandemic how easily funds can be shifted given an urgency. So, I think it's just not urgent enough. We don't have enough disasters just yet to step into action as yeah, certain societies. Mm -hmm. But, um, okay, but now just for a few more minutes, let's make it pragmatic again. So, what are what are common or just a few integrity issues that come to mind? And what are recommendations to not let them arise in the first place or mitigate? And that can be, well, obviously there's intended misbehavior, which then leads to a, valid, uh, is a um, violation of integrity or unintendedly so. So what are common integrity issues that you often find yourself talking about or dealing with in your position? Well, the commonest, I would say, that an editor faces are plagiarism, which oh, is yeah. at the top of the list. Um, and authorship disputes is another one where, you know, the researchers yeah. don't agree in advance who um is going to be authors there's even you know authors will also argue about the order of authorship as well oh, but isn't that now possible to solve with a credit taxonomy well the order of the authorship not necessarily because you know people want to either be the last author or the first author and there's only you know there's only one physical space that a particular name can take so the credit taxonomy will will identify each author's contribution yeah. But also still want you know their names to be first or last. So yeah, um, be, like actually like, visible and identifiable with their names. Like, yes, exactly. And that is very; those are very, very common. And and really, you know, this shouldn't be the issue an issue for a journal editor to sort out. This is the researchers should sort this out before, right at the beginning. <laughs> they should have the conversation about where the authors are going to go and who the authors are going to be, and then and the authors should fulfill the criteria for authorship because they should have made the uh, you know significant contributions but importantly what authors forget is that with authorship comes responsibility joint responsibility yeah. for the integrity of the work and so often when there is an issue an ethical issue with a published article you know some of the authors will step back and say oh well i didn't know anything about this you know it wasn't me who did this and you just think, well, you know, as, a, as an author, you all of you are collectively responsible for the, you know, you are a, you are accountable for your vouching for the in integrity of the work. That you you're... put your name to this, so stand exactly, up. Exactly. Yeah. So you know, so because you can't partially retract an article, you can't just retract one particular author's contribution to an article. If an article's retracted, the whole thing is, mm -hmm. uh, and authors don't really. Um, appreciate the responsibility that comes with authorship. Although I might not even be aware, it's like, oh, the PI yeah. carries it all, but I mean, they only have so much insight to the actual research being done in the lab. Uh. The other issue is um, just adding and taking away authors, again, because they don't appreciate what authorship means. So they will suddenly, you know, halfway through the peer review process, a new name will appear on a revised manuscript or names will change and you know that's a bit odd you know how can how can you suddenly decide somebody who didn't make a contribution or did make a contribution halfway through the mm. peer review process of a piece of research that's very common as well. yeah. Yeah. but that's not i think a good thing with preprints as much as you can also question integrity there because it hasn't gone through peer review or formal peer review that is Whatever that means, but that's for another day to discuss. Another, another podcast, <laughs> yeah. um, because preprints can factually be living documents, and there it very much makes sense to lose or gain uh, numbers of authors to different versions of the manuscripts. And not so much lose, though. But I've actually thought because if if I like I've worked at projects in the past where we wrote articles together on like meta research and then in the first draft published there was like i don't know let's give it a number of seven or so co-authors 
And then the iteration of that same article, how would you shoot? To, I mean, it's, it's also for the authors to consider, but no, I think would then, even if one of them wouldn't contribute to the revision, would they still be listed as, I guess the answer is yes, because they've contributed to the first draft. Sorry, I didn't really finish my sentences. You get the idea? But, yeah. but in some cases, yes. it's actually difficult because we had cases where there was a moral concern to continue working on the... I mean, there would still... And, okay, with preprints and like archive preprints with the eyes and everything, a second version with the... Can, in some cases has fewer authors because some decide not to continue working on the project anymore, but they're listed in the first version. Okay, now that's more or less the same situation with a different outcome. But I guess it depends then on whether the you know, the authors contributed something, so they were on the first version. Yeah. And then in the next version, has their contribution been removed from the from the manuscript? And probably not. So then they, they've still made a contribution. So it's very odd that if they were deemed worthy to have contributed originally, why they would then not, you know, no longer be, unless all of their work is removed from the, from the, from the manuscript so that it, they, there is no longer their contribution. Yeah. There. No, I'm very... thinking on a particular, it's not that they were deemed unworthy to be continued to list, be listed, but because they decided not to be affiliated with their so project. Yeah. But even that is a, it's a difficult concept because then they're sort of abdicating responsibility. If their mm. work is still in the article, but then they're saying, oh, I don't want to be authored. No. I find yep. that, then who's responsible for that work? It sort of still raises questions. Yeah, but I mean, the accountability is... Okay, I'm more about thinking this. <laughs> I think it's not so, e so easy to be so... No. It's more, uh, I mean, authorship is more complicated than authors realise. I think yeah. that's the time. They, they, you know, often see it as a very sort of straightforward, oh, we'll add a few people, we'll take a few people off, and people will do each other favours and this and that. But they don't, because they don't understand what authorship, the responsibility that goes with authorship, they miss all the, yeah. the, the, the nuances that go with The it. downstream consequences also, like yeah. collective responsibility and accountability for the work presented and yeah like yeah well i haven't thought about this in that depth thanks <laughs> all right okay um so when it comes to authorship and then methodology methodology also like we talked in um before the this recording also about the opportunity for editors to reject certain papers where they have moral concerns so they can put to place their own moral standards irrespective of the ethical standards that are um, imposed by the researcher community submitting the, the article. Is that it? Because um, like we were looking specifically at animal research where where you commented on a particular use case but is it is that basically the outcome that to call upon editors look as your own community running a journal you can set your own standards on ethical grounds as long as you make them transparent it's like look based on these and these reference points and our own policy we won't accept your article because we have more concerns I think up to a point that's right, but a journal has to have transparent policies mm. to begin with. So an editor can't just chop and change depending on their, you know, their, their feelings on a particular day. The, the, the editor has to think about what, what are the standards that they want to uphold for this particular yeah. journal. And they have to have those policies in the public domain for that journal to start mm. with. And then... Then, I mean, in in a lot of ways, that's that's good for the researcher because then they know where they stand, they know what their expectations are for the for the research in that journal, and it in in empowers the editor then to make decisions about you know whether or not they want a certain piece of research 
mm. published in their journal. And certainly, I mean, we're talking about animal research, but, but also, you know, in human research, when I was a, an editor, a medical editor, it did, you know, if I felt something was unethical, a piece of research was unethical, even if the authors had ticked all the policy boxes, you know, they've got the permissions, they, you know, uh, they've got consent or whatever, and they ticked all the boxes. If the actual research made me uncomfortable as mm-hmm. an editor, I felt empowered to just say, no, you know, I, I don't I don't think this is um, ethical research and I don't want it published in my journal. Yeah. And, and that's also that... an opportunity for the whole editorial team to raise the bar of yeah. ethical yeah, I mean, it is. It, I mean, what you don't want to happen is for the bar to be dropped, mm. which is why there should be written policies. The you know, journal should have transparent policies mm. to show where their bar is in the first place. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Okay. Well, wow. all right. I think that's enough ground to cover and to think about for for today's discussion. <laughs> It's lovely. Yes. Give, give me a lot. Yeah. Thank you so much. And then on other aspects uh, that concern integrity and ethics and open science principles and how to mitigate, not only mitigate, but how to navigate those, we'll most likely find, uh, yeah, come back into this room and, and share with you all. Thanks for listening. And thank you so much, Jisha. Thank you for being with us. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us to listen to this episode. Do let us know what you think. You can email us or connect with us on our social media channels, which you can find on our website at accesstoperspectives.org. Email us at info at accesstoperspectives.org or book a call to explore how we can support you with your research planning, management and publishing. Welcome you again soon for our next episode. Until then, have a great time.